much. If you're looking to find out what Top Coder is, how we work, our methodology, this is not really the presentation, I'm sorry for that. Um, feel free to come up to me after. Uh, we have Mike Morris, our CEO, Clinton Bonner, uh, head of marketing, Aaron Williams here from marketing as well. So just grab one of us, pull us to the side, and uh, we're happy to walk through that with you. All right. So you can click it yourself. Sure. Okay. So uh, let's just jump right in. All right. So Top Coder, what is behind the premise of Top Coder and why does it relate to crowdsourcing? Well, it was started from a simple premise. Really simple, find the best coders in the world. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever played chess, but the founder of Top Coder did, and he was like, why can't we rank coders simply like we rank chess players? So with that premise, we found that we were able to create a platform and a community that has delivered tremendous value for multiple clients, but particularly in the public sector. We found that we were able to reframe the way that the public sector looks at doing software development and even R&D. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you guys will be believers of this. Um, but it's my, my goal today to communicate some of that to you. So just a quick uh, overview of Top Coder. Uh, over 1.3 million developers in the community today. Uh, we're all over the world, 190 plus countries. Uh, just to give you some more eye candy, five times more engineers than Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter combined. Uh, on average, we have about 1,800 members every week, new members every week. We've given out $80 million to the platform through a series of coding contests. And we get about 35,000 logins every 90 days. All right, so I mentioned it's history time, right? So let's talk a little bit about uh, the origins, right, and, and where we've been. So in 2001, I mentioned Top Coder got started. How do we find the best coders in the world through competition? Um, 2004, a crazy professor from Harvard Business School comes up with a paper, right? He, he takes an interest in top coder, coder, writes an interesting academic paper on the efficiency of uh, large numbers when you're attacking problems that require different perspectives. And that sets off a series of wonderful events for top coder, but actually interesting events when you're looking at government innovation. So around 2005, the NSA comes knocking on our door and is very interested in recruiting the top talent that we've sourced. So several years go by and we start to realize, hey, not only do we have a great talent pool, we can orient these top developers to solve really challenging problems. So we launched the first marathon match in 2007. 2009, NSA follows that up with a, a marathon match around uh, uh, crypto cryptography called the Enigma Challenge. In 2010, NASA jumps in. So NASA, combined with Harvard, create the NASA Tournament Lab, of which Top Coder was able to work through sub-awards with Harvard on a variety of problems across multiple agencies. In 2011, we were on the GSA schedule. Uh, DARPA also reached out to us to do some, um, to build some communities around uh, computer science and STEM. And then 2015, we were officially able to get on a, a contract, direct contract with NASA uh, for open innovation services. And there's multiple vendors on that, and the number of crowdsourcing projects has grown since then across the board in government, not just Top Coder. As you can see in 2016, 2017, I uh, put in some, some private sector highlights as well, just to, so that you all know that that's a, a big part of our business as well. We've done work with Apple, GE, IBM, and today in the government, we've been in CMS, IARPA, EPA, the Air Force, DOE, Veterans, the Patent, uh, Patent and Trademark Office, OPM, Office of Personnel Management, and even USAID. So it's quite a footprint, but it all started with recruiting, right? So let's uh, take a little walk back in time to our Top Coder Open. So in order to assess who's the best coder in the world, you got to get everybody together and have them compete, right? So that's what we do in the Top Coder Open, and the first one was actually in 2001. In 2005, we get a sponsorship from NSA, and they want to come to the event. They want to talk to coders. They want to see, uh, you know, what can these what can these folks do? Once again, to, uh, 2006, we get some more top coders. We get some more sponsorship from NSA. 2007, mysterious people with sunglasses start showing up. Ha! And then, oh wait, there he is again. 2007. Looking closer, oh wait, it's actually just a Top Coder member. Um, turns out they just really like to dress up while competing. So 
NSA sponsored uh, all the way through 2009, um, and you know there was a full recruiting uh, component as well. But I think what was most important is that after seeing the community and talking to some of these developers, they realized that, hey, we can really get a lot of value out of having these unique, bright minds solve really challenging problems. And that's when we took a harder look at how can we monetize this offering. So we have uh, you know, an algorithms and R&D offering, and it's centered around this idea that you know, great, great ideas, great innovation, doesn't always come from the traditional experts. So NSA, as I mentioned, they put up a challenge. Um, if anybody's familiar with uh, World War I, World War II cryptography, and is familiar with encoders, um, th there's a famous Enigma machine. They put out an Enigma challenge to the entire top, top coder community, and they needed the algorithm to work with under, uh, in under 60 seconds. And uh, a member of the community was able to solve it in, in a one-week marathon match. And this became like, you know, a, a big lightning rod. Basically, we realized like, hey, there's some repeatability here. You know, we, we can do this across different domains. So today, we have about 450,000 data scientists in the community. Uh, we have about 78 average uh, competitors per challenge and 578 average submissions per challenge. So you can see that increased optionality, lots of different approaches attacking your problem. So as I've mentioned, we've you know, developed some products around this, you know, a series of sprints, a series of ma marathon matches, but it's probably best just to go through a quick case study. So the EPA actually came to us with a database of about 1,800 uh, toxins, and they were able to simulate those toxins in animal metabolism. And they wanted to see, well, what's the lowest dose of toxin that we can put in an animal's meta metabolism such that um, it wouldn't report high toxicity levels. So basically, they wanted to predict toxicity in animals as a precursor to predicting toxicity in humans. It had never been done before. Seems a little bit of a stretch, right? We're talking about top coders, hyper-specialized individuals who solve tough coding or algorithmic challenges. Can they attack this, right? Well, not only did they generate a completely brand new approach, there was tons of participation. You know, 49 different competitors out of 338 registrants, 804 submissions. They were constantly optimizing their algorithms through the marathon match. And then finally, this all, this all took place in only three weeks. So the EPA was able to not only use this internally, but they made it open source and gave it to the science research community so that they could learn from it as well. All right, so I mentioned you know, early on in the timeline, we had this aha moment with marathon matches. We also, around 2007, realized that, hey, we could do some interesting work around design competitions, as well as prototype development, straight software dev. So back, going back in time, I pulled out this amazing piece of collateral from our Top Coder Studio offering. I see Mike wincing back there, which means it's good. I think what's so incredibly uh, ironic about this is there's clip art on it. I mean, it's like we pulled out the get a fresh perspective right out of like Microsoft clip art. Um, but you can see that, you know, at this time we, we weren't really using the community to do our own design as we do today. but. It, the offering, nonetheless, was successful. So even with the Stanky Flyer, we were still able to get uh, great clients to, to try it out. So through the NASA Tournament Lab, and uh, I see a lot of the, the folks on, on the screen in the audience as well, you know, we've had some really great clients, really great relationships over the years. But we were able to test this out. We were able to say, hey, all right, can we generate an application first with a wireframe from the community? And how do we exactly do that? Because design's not necessarily as concrete of a, of a scoring as, as an algorithm's uh, performance is. Well, what we do is we take multiple submissions, but we allow the uh, sponsor of the challenge to have some checkpoints or some feedback so that they can kind of shape that design across a wide variety of submissions. Then, next, after we get this wireframe, then we build out the code. So we're able to do that through the challenge framework once again. Multiple submissions, we hook up this code to the wireframe, and what do you have? Well, in this case, this is an example of uh, you know, web-based software that we built for the International Space Station that is operational right now. 
and it basically monitors the food intake of astronauts. So this was something that was developed in about eight months, but totally crowdsourced and in operation, you know, at the, at the highest level of, of uh, you know, fidelity and, and risk management on the space station. So it was, it was a true validation of this, you know, theory that we had, and, you know, we, we currently do tons of this today. All right, so talked a little bit about, you know, where we've been, you know, it started with recruiting, then we got into algorithms and software development, but today, as we, as we mentioned, you know, we've developed a platform, and we are able to identify top talent, and we have a methodology that allows us to use this desire of, of, of top co of, of coders and their, their, their love of learning to actually produce a tremendous amount of value. But this is what we didn't expect. What if we could develop the skills of an entire community? So this is what we kind of fell into, really, uh, with, with our veterans community. So we realized that it's a tough transition for veterans who are coming back maybe from active duty and transitioning to civilian life. And oftentimes they get a short window to skill up for their, their civilian jobs. So what we did is we thought, well, wouldn't this be a great way that we could create a community of veterans interested in learning more about coding. They could both earn some money as well as develop um, skills so that they could use those skills for their transition. So we were able to do this. We created a private community on TopCoder. And we also found that it allowed a, a kind of ancillary effect. Not only are they learning and earning funds, they're also able to provide feedback on products that matter most to veterans. So it has the prosumer effect. So not only are they competing on these competitions, they're saying, you know what, I don't think this would be meaningful to veterans. And I can give you an example of one of the projects we've run with the, run with the community. So we, we wanted to, together with the, the Veterans Affairs Group, we wanted to re-envision how we memorialize fallen soldiers. And the first step in doing this was to create some type of a, a platform where you could have like a digital footprint of their, that individual that meant so, so much to you. So veterans have started to work on this particular project. Uh, this is a you know, first, first draft of it, um, but it's gonna be a community where you can post digitally um, you know, and, and memorialize your loved ones. And you know, Jera, who might be here, I'm not sure, was was a real large, you know, champion of this project from beginning to end. And you know, she herself is a veteran, and she's now moved over to Challenge.gov and is kind of ru running uh, that program across the government as well. But it's not only was she, you know she visionary in seeing where where the program could go, um, but you know, she practices in the field of innovation and has that kind of veteran's perspective. So it was just a, it was a great synergy for, for TopCoder. All right, so we've talked about where we've been, what we do, you know, how we're you know, finding ourselves in new offerings, but you know, where do we go from here, right? This is the best part of uh, CSW. I think you know, up until now, it might be kind of like the traditional kind of business uh, conversation. You, know, you have some case studies, you have a little bit of a timeline, you know, what does it mean for us in this room? You know, what is Top Coder's involvement over the past 10 years with the public sector, in particular the federal government, mean on a grander scale? And, you know, what is our moment in history? Well, let's, uh, let's tell you a little bit of a, 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 a possible adjacent story. So when you look at innovations which are spun off or started by you know, a government investor or a government first mover, if you will, they have some commonality to it. So this, you know, background image is actually of some engineers in the Arroyo Seco that eventually started the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But in 1942, there was a test flight of the V2 bomb. And the Germans were, were first, to, first to finish, so to speak. And the moment that the U.S. got word of this, the Army actual Air Forces immediately scanned the U.S. looking for you know, any research groups that had, had expertise in rocketry. Up until that point, rocketry was laughable. It was like playing with fireworks. But you know what? At Caltech, there was one guy, Professor Von Karman, who had a rocketry group. And immediately, in 1942, all of a sudden, Aerojet was founded. And 
2,000 rockets were ordered in 1943, and subsequently that created the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then during peacetime, you know, rockets became satellites, and you know, we transitioned from Aerojet to Rocketdyne. So that was the inception of an industry. Let's look at another example. You know, the internet, right? Let's look at something tech, maybe not so hardware focused. But, you know, 1969, similar phenomenon. We have some academic universities sending packets of information, right? 1969, I think it was Klein Rock at UCLA sends some packets of information to Stanford Research uh, Lab. I think it was uh, Doug Engelbart. And from that moment, you know, that the ARPANET was formed. DARPA notoriously funded this. Uh, then Vint Cerf from UCL, well, Vint Cerf from Stanford went to DARPA and started pushing that program further. He started writing, you know, the, these uh, grant, writing the, the requirements for these grants. And a company by the name of BBN, a government contractor, actually produced one of the first telnets. So later on, you know, this became Sprint. And you know what's shown behind you is actually one of the first kind of original full routers that uh, got a lot smaller. But you can see once again, you know, similar pattern. Okay, so what have we seen? We have usually a government first mover. We have, you know, a prestigious university player, and then we have an industry catalyst. So if you're looking at crowdsourcing. You know, NASA has been a huge sponsor. As I mentioned, NSA, DARPA, the military were involved as well. You know, we have a university that's taken a unique interest, as well as others. And from, from early days, TopCoder has been involved. Now, today, there's a variety of folks doing open innovation and crowdsourcing, and TopCoder recently has been acquired by a larger company called Wipro, which can give it some of that scale. But you have to ask yourself, you know, what happens next? So only time is going to tell what happens next, but I think everybody in this room realizes that you know, we're here for a reason, right? Because we see potential. And I think if you're looking at the arc of history, we're still on the rise, and we have a head start. So a lot of the reason why we do have a head start is because we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So I wanted to give some special thanks to some folks who really made this uh, presentation possible. But yeah, we have some old photos of Andy Lamora, Jesse Ford, who runs all of our Top Coder Open. Uh, Clinton Bonner is here somewhere. Rosh, he's not here, but he also contributed to this as well. And we got Mike Morris before he went totally gray, uh, like in 2005, and Brendan as well. So with that, uh, Hopefully, you know, I've convinced you, maybe, or maybe not, that uh, TopCoder has kind of reframed how government is doing its software development and R&D. And hopefully, I've uh, maybe given you some hope to keep working, whatever field you have or whatever specialty, that, you know, things are going to get even better in the next decade ahead. Great. Thank you, Mike. And you, and you crowdsourced your presentation. Basically, yeah. Basically, yeah. It was yeah. Slack, Slack source, I think. Uh, <laughs> internal crowdsourcing. Um, should we have a question for you? Nope. Um, uh, one or two questions? Anyone? Anyone has a question for Mike? Anyone? Yes, please, Caroline. Can you go Mike to Caroline, please? Right here. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's great. Um, what's the payment system for the coders, please? <laughs> so payments are, you know, performance-based. So it's based on a, you know, first, second, and third place. So there are specifications and requirements that you have to meet for each challenge. And then based on how well you meet those specs and requirements, uh, top coders are paid out. Mm -hmm. One more right there. Uh, and that side. The idea of crowdsourcing tech is definitely yeah, it's a really good point. Um, so most of the work, actually all of the work that I discussed was you know, unclassified. So that, that obviously you know, allows us to do a little bit more in terms of recruitment and who works on it. Um, so there's a lot that can be done in the unclassified space. Um, 
you know, if, if you're, we generally find that when talking about IP, that's not so much of an issue. Um, you know, the client usually gets the IP, whether they're government or enterprise client. But yeah, going forward, um, I think that would be the next frontier for us. And there's some opportunity maybe with the veterans community to start to work on classified work. Great. Mike, thank you. Thanks for being part of it and looking forward. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.